Hello. Uh, my name is Steve Peacock. I'm the CEO of a company called Dragon's Arm, an agile training organisation. Uh, now, I'm sorry I can't be there with you this afternoon, uh, but the events of the past few days in New Zealand have meant that I've been unable to get to you, so I hope you'll forgive me and understand this. So who am I, first of all? I am, the, as I said, the CEO of a company called Dragon's Arm. I'm an agile coach and trainer, and I love that agile trainer part. But I've been all through my life in some way or another relating to uh, organisational change. So what are we going to talk about today? Well, as the title said, it was talking about culture, but I want to talk about the view of the different two different types of culture, private organisation versus government department culture. Now, neither of them are bad and neither of them are good. They are just simply different cultures. So I'm not putting either of them down, there's just a difference. And, what I, and why I'm talking about it is the effect that it had in the learning that I had to do when I tried to put Put my private organisational training and experience into a government organisation and the culture that I met there. Now I'm going to talk about Statistics New Zealand which is a fabulous uh, government department and I'm going to tell you about a natural disaster that happened and how this affected that part, department and then six months later I joined them as their agile coach and all the learnings and failures that I went through for that. But first, an understanding about this discussion is that I'm not talking for uh, Statistics New Zealand or for any other organisation. I'm talking on my own. And my, what I saw uh, and how I perceived that and my learnings and failings, I'm not... While I have permission from Statistics New Zealand and they understand this talk is happening, it's all about uh, being able to... Uh, understand it from my point of view. First of all, what is your definition of culture? Well, here's one, but that's not the type of culture that I'm talking about. Yes, that's me on the right there, and that's my wife next to us. Yes, we're Chinese, and we went up last month uh, into the Punjab area of India and immersed ourselves completely in Indian culture. Uh, when my daughter on the left there got married to uh, my now my son-in-law, uh, they'd been married in New Zealand for a couple of years, but we went back to India to do the official, if you like, the Indian full immense uh, area. It was a lot of fun. We had a ball. I, used, I even got to dance. It was a lot of fun. But what do you mean by culture? If I had to think of a few words, it comes down to this. The way we do things here. And I don't, I don't know, I can't remember where I heard that from, but it's stuck. And I think that is a correct definition of culture. The way we do things here. So I talk about a private sector and what I was used to, because I've been through private sectors quite a lot. I'll talk about Stats LLC, a US company, but it's a multinational company. It has uh, offices in almost every city in the entire world, and I would not be surprised at all. In fact, I would be surprised if there isn't an office uh, where you are now. So Stats um, is after sporting analytics, a multi-billion dollar industry, and they lead the way in that. Uh, now, I was with a team as their uh, program manager in a little place called Palmerston North, about two hours north of where I am here in Wellington, New Zealand. Uh, we worked with that. We, uh, the team wasn't particularly productive uh, when I came there, and with what I was doing, it, it, there was problems with, with the code that they produced, and the customers weren't happy. So after about a year of trying, and I wouldn't do it without the permission of the head office, the head office said, OK, well, go for it. Give it a try, see what happens. And this is changing it to Agile. And in fact, I'll relate it to Scrum. Now, Scrum is a framework that can easily be have Agile added to it, but it's a framework on its own. Uh, so what I did was I sat down with the team and I said, this is what Scrum is. These are the things that you'll be expected to do. How about we start doing that from Thursday? I said, don't worry, 
just do it for a couple of sprints. Now, sprints were two weeks at that stage. Let's do it for a couple of weeks sprints. At the end of two sprints, at the retrospective we have at the end of that, we can ask the question, should, do we want to continue working this way or should we go back the old way? And if you want to go back the old way, I'll step back and say, cool, we tried. It was fun, we tried, we decided it's not best. So we went to this way. Uh, it was quite easy to do. In fact, it was child's play, really. When you're in a position when you can ask the team to do something and there's a certain expectation that they do it, uh, then that's a lot better. It's not command and control, it's culture. Uh, they, if, when they ask to do something, they can do something. Now, a government department has a different type of culture. A government department has, do I really need to do that now? Who's asking? Why is it asking? What's it important? Oh, they don't know anything. I'll carry on. That's sort of a government culture. Now, that's not bad or good. It's simply the culture. So I joined this company, as I said, called Statistics New Zealand, and I came across a... Uh, an interesting guy called Chris Buxton. Now, he started as the CIO, Chief Information Officer for Stats NZ in March 2014. Now, he implemented things that were quite radical at the time. He wanted to take, he took a look at this and said, we're not an IT organization. He joined the IT department. He wanted to take the word IT out of the language altogether. He said, we're not about hardware. When you say IT, you're thinking service and you're thinking printed. We're not about that. We're about information. We're about databases. We're digital. So he changed the IT department to be digital business systems, and he changed to support that. He took a radical approach back then, which is quite a gamble, and he changed his own title from CIO to CDO, Chief Digital Officer. Now, that was a gamble because back then, Chief Digital Officer wasn't thought of as on the same level as CIO. So he effectively took a step backwards, but he also showed everybody that he was behind his, uh, what he was doing. Uh, the old hierarchy of command and control uh, eventually moved on, and he implemented a new management team uh, that uh, was supportive and uh, working for that sort of an agile uh, way of being able to assist teams to do what they need. Uh, and he started awareness around Agile, but he had this vision of DevOps. DevOps, he said, was a five to seven year uh, implementation. Uh, I know organizations can sometimes do this in a year. No, he realized this is a government organization. Things work slow there. Uh, so he had this five to seven year uh, vision and he had Agile as the first step to that. So he started to, uh, he changed the team names from uh, development teams to DevOps teams. He had the team leads renamed to DevOps managers. Uh, would have liked to be involved in that decision, but that's what happened. So, and then it happened. In November 2016, parts of New Zealand stood up eight metres taller and walked five metres further north. I uh, don't know if you can see it in there, but right in the very centre of that picture are two people standing up against that where they'd stood up and walked forward. Um, so that rip in the earth uh, went for over 170 kilometres. Now that's something. Uh, why am I talking to you about this? When the government uh, city of Wellington was hundreds of kilometres away from this? Well, this is the reason. That later, gentlemen, what you're looking at there is what happened at midnight on that, uh, that fateful day. Over a couple of minutes, uh, floors pancaked down on top of each other. The structural um, beams went out of alignment. One of them was even leaning away from the building itself. It was not able to be went and go, gone into. These photos were taken by remote control. There was no way to, anybody was going to be inside that building again. You couldn't go in to get a hard disk. You couldn't go in to grab that server. You couldn't even get your laptop off, off your desk to take it away with you. That was it. So, in effect, statistics 
New Zealand lost 90% of its IT capability overnight. Now, how many organisations do you know in the world that would survive that? And this is where fantastic people as Statistics New Zealand just simply got up and got things done. They re-established core production services within five days and the full restoration of all OIT within 12 weeks. That's fantastic. And it's amazing. But at what cost? What did this create? Well, this ended up creating a bit of a problem in that the solution also became the problem. The solution was the hero. People would just do things. Now, why was that a problem? Because when I came along to try and implement Agile, we had a hero type of mentality within there, a hero culture, if you like, in that what do heroes do? They work on their own. They do things. They make decisions. They shift everything and they, they solve problems immediately. Uh, but sometimes the decisions they make affect people. But they don't talk to the people and ask the people who are going to be affected about those decisions. They just make those decisions. So their own hierarchy of power. And it's not inducive to teamwork or agile. So that's what happened there. We had nine DevOps teams, or development teams if you like, but nine DevOps teams, uh, three very high file, file, uh, profile projects, and these were so high profile that if I wanted to implement a change that they didn't like, they'd just bulldoze it out and say, no, that's not going to happen. And they had the power to do that. So I met up with a culture clash, if you like, when I walked in there. So what happened? Well, it's not the old government culture, but something different. And when you, when you talk about government culture in New Zealand, you start thinking about the 1980s, where uh, people who worked in government went to work all, all day with a specific requirement of ensuring they didn't do any work. Uh, read the paper all morning, went out for two-hour lunches, and sort of go, went home early each day. And there was no, that was, that, that was the, perception of what's happening and I know there were very, some very hard workers in there but that was the perception of government that's not what I'm talking about here that perception disappeared uh, over the next uh, 20 or 30 years uh, what happened here was that we have the heroes uh, fabulous people the experts and I'm talking about international well-known experts that work in New Zealand it's an amazing place uh, and we have the mother hen protectors. Now, what am I mean by that? The mother hen protectors will protect me, um, their team from me, for example, or they protect their team from anything else. Um, when they ask them for reports, that's nothing to do with you. I don't want any, no, 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 go away. You trying to uh, say that my team is wrong, go away. Um, so you have that type of culture. You have the biases. Now, these biases are normal in all organisations, so, but it's the same biases that you, would, you, you come across. And that's things like the confirmation bias. The confirmation bias says they're looking for things that support what they already believe in. So if you're telling them something different, and they already have another belief, then all they're hearing are the words that support their belief. Uh, we all do it. It's natural. Uh, you've got the imposter syndrome, which is your experts. They don't want to anybody else to interrupt them. They like their expert status, and they become a just a team member. Then they're nothing, whereas they're experts. And, if, uh, and this imposter syndrome says if somebody looks over their shoulder and says, what are you doing, how are you doing it, they'll realise it's very easy what they're doing. But it's only easy because they're international experts in the specific thing that they do. Um, so you've got that. And you, I come across quite a lot, they, you, uh, we are already agile. Uh, for a reason that some of them might have had some scrum training uh, about eight to ten years ago. Uh, some of them had statement of, oh, we once worked in an agile team. Yeah. And uh, some of them felt that I even had one person say, oh, but we belong to a DevOps team, therefore we're already DevOps. Uh, 
it's a it's a difficult situation to go through. And remember, uh, I didn't have any power, any status, anything whatsoever. Nobody had to even listen to me. So I had the sudden realization by lunchtime on the first day, this wasn't going to be done by Thursday. I was out of my depth. I knew that at the time. I was almost ready to walk away from this. Uh, the only tool I had was influence because I had no uh, power with what I'm doing. I wasn't in a specific uh, status that said that I could ask teams to do something. And quite frankly, none of them reported to me. They all reported to different people. They didn't even have to listen to me. So we had a problem. I was out of my depth. Uh, after a while, uh, I didn't have access to the teams because you had those mother hen protectors. I uh, didn't have access to find out what they were doing because there was no reports. Um, and if I asked for them, I wasn't given them. Uh, so uh, we had a problem. When you spoke to each of those DevOps managers and anybody else in the organization, they were all quite willing to speak to me. They thought I was a, uh, when I first came on, a, a management spy. They quickly realized that I'm not that. I'm quite a nice guy. They all had, gave me the time of day. They all spoke to me. They all went out with coffee with me, all of those sort of things. So I then became, rather than a management spy, I became something called harmless, <laughs> which means I had practically no influence whatsoever. So if that was my tool, it was totally inactive. Uh, so the first thing I did there, um, I realized after a while, after trying almost every other thing that I could think of, talking to other coaches and trying their suggestions, all the other things that you'd normally try, I realized that if you spoke to every one of those people there and ask them about Agile, everyone would give you a different uh, statement, uh, a different reason for, a different meaning for Agile, and probably very few of them, if any, would have anything to do with the Agile manifesto. So I said, Chris, we need training. And I went to him and I said, you're in luck, Chris, because I'm a certified IC Agile trainer and I have a company that is an IC Agile member organization, so I'm also allowed to put on this training. And I've also created uh, certified training materials for that. So let's put these through training. He was thrilled. He was great. We did that. Over 200 people were now certified after a while, after a few months of going through that. It was great fun. It was a lot of fun. But what happened was teams were inspired to try because during the training, I in told them about all the other teams and what they've done. I've told them about changes and how it can happen and how it can affect teams. They were uh, interested in what's happening. I answered their questions. We did the full training of what this actually means and where it means. So they understood, they were on the same page uh, and they were inspired when they leave that. Um, the conversations changed after that. Uh, there were, uh, it, was, it was quite interesting to take it. That was the first step that I could actually make. Uh, agile meetings were actually happening. So you can go around, you can see the normal things like your stand-ups, your sew cases, your other bits and pieces were actually happening. They were there. Um, there was still protectionism there, so you weren't able, still weren't able to get to see uh, things like your burn-down charts, and I'd learn why later. Um, and other reporting, but otherwise they were actually quite inspired and I then became, had some um, ability to have influence. Uh, and people would come to me and talk to me about this and I'd take them to the Agile Manifesto that I planted on the wall and I'd say, well, let's see what the manifesto says about this first and we talk about that. And it's quite good. Um, so we, things changed there, that was a big step. Learning number two, was about acceptance. I had to accept that some people were not going to be on this journey with me. Uh, that was very difficult for me as a person, but uh, Chris Buxton helped me along on that one. He said, he took me to a side a few times. He says, not everybody's gonna do this. Not everybody's gonna come along. We have to accept that. Um, so it's not my fault, nor is it my problem if they don't. So 
That was the next one I had to do. In the end, what happened was that people went along, not because of my teachings or my influence or anything else, but because they wanted to be part of the team. And they saw the team doing things, so they were fine. Yes, one or two still are not part of that team. They've gone off and do, done something else. And, and on the whole, we treat them as an outsourced contractor, if you like, send them stuff and expect it back again. Um, so that's rather sad, but I'm hoping the, that, you know, we're still not finished this journey. They, so now that I had that, I took a look at the teams and I wanted to know what problems they face. I still didn't get any reports. I still didn't get any burn downs. I still didn't get any indication of the types of work that they were doing, um, which by now is, is rather difficult. You know, what work are they doing? I don't know because I don't have access to it. Um, so the only thing I did have access to was a tool that they used called Jira. Now, Jira I've learned, I've used before, so it was I know about it. If you don't know about Jira, it started out as a bug tracking online tool, uh, and it became very agile and a way of working through stories. Um, so every project had a different process that they it can go through. So if you think about a scrum board, it has you know things like um, you know a simple scrum board might have to do in progress, in test, done, and that's a process. Um, so it's one of the ways you can do that. Uh, you can set up your own process for each one. So I started looking at that and I came across something like this. <laughs> now, when you look at it, you'll see uh, those red signs in there. This isn't the actual ones. This is just something I got off the web. Uh, but it's an, it gives you an example of what I was faced with. Those red uh, steps in there might be, one might be build, where the development team actually does the programming and gets it done. And the other one might be rework, for example. And I said, you can't, how can you operate like this? You can't. What say we change this a little bit for the teams to be able to do their work properly? Now, I realized very quickly that this is the business process, this isn't the development process. And the teams were being forced to use this process rather than theirs because they belong to the business. Ha! So here's the challenge I had. The first one is to drag the teams back into DBS. Now that might sound anti-agile, not to work closely with your customer. But I'm saying they're still working closely with the customer, they're just not doing what the customer's doing. They're doing the development side of things. So it's a, it's a way of working that they have to have their own boards. And those boards have to have things on them that are not the business thing. So the business asks them to do a story, they can process it through their own five to seven steps um, and finish it so that they can get it done within that sprint. I insisted that only columns that are steps in their process that the teams can control should be on that Scrum or Kanban board, not things they can't control. And as I went round, they were all accepting of this. They, they loved it. They, they thought it was good. I had some uh, long conversations with business who realised that, no, they weren't really losing control. They were allowing the teams to process in the best ways they could. Um, and they can, because it's an online tool this year, they can still see what's happening. But the biggest problem I had there was that I t said, saw the teams all had user acceptance testing as a column. And I said, why do you have that as a column? Oh, because things come back from user acceptance testing. And I said, do you control user acceptance testing? No, but things come back from it. We do that, it gets tested, it gets done, it goes to user, it, get, you know, it, it, it completes its testing, goes to user acceptance testing, and then it might come back might have, might have failed user acceptance testing and go back into the need to be done again straight away. So it goes back into to, the to-do column. And here I had another big long discussion and a number of discussions with both teams and businesses because I said nothing can ever, ever fail the user acceptance test. And I know what you're saying, but, 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 but that's the actual fact. Nothing can fail user acceptance test. 
Um, yes, but what happens if it doesn't work? Well, if it doesn't work, you've got a bug. So you create a bug, you tell them the steps was created, and you file that with the team, and the team can prioritise it as normal. Wow, that's a big bug, it needs to be done now. It's, it's more important than what um, these team is working on now, so it has to be done within the sprint. Bring it in, add it to the sprint, drop off whatever's needed so that we can still finish the sprint, and away we go. Or it's the columns are not quite lined up. Well, that's okay, but let's do that next sprint. Those sort of uh, priorities are, are now able to be related rather than simply absolutely everything being done as a bug because it failed user acceptance test. So now they understood only, only the user acceptance tests cannot fail, but new stories or bugs can come out of that. Now they know when a story is done. Suddenly they're now able to publish their burn downs because for the first time ever, they're getting stuff actually done within their sprint. They can finish a sprint, they can reach their sprint goals, but it hasn't passed UAT. That's a business process. That's not a development process. So people were starting to get that, it was good. Then I started the next step in my learning, something I tried to do at the beginning, but of course I had no um, say in anything and no uh, ability to ask the team to do something. Now I did. So I asked to become, I took a look at one team that I had been working with quite regularly. Uh, and <clears throat> they were having a great deal of problems because they had a very um, controlling, if you like, uh, business unit that they work for or customer. Uh, and such, to such a point where they would get a a job spec come to them that was already said, this will take you three weeks, we expect it back then. Um, and then they get blamed that it didn't come back within three weeks and there was all sorts of problems. And, and during that time, of course, business would come to, oh, we'll change this and oh, we'll change that and oh, we'll change that. So they couldn't get things done, they had a problem. So I suggested to them, and I realized that these people were team leads. They'd never been trained as a scrum master. Although I took them through training and agile training and I used Scrum heavily within that training, they never really had that Scrum, Scrum Master training that you'd get. So I took over as the Scrum Master for the team on the uh, agreement with the DevOps manager. And he was thrilled with it. He wanted to see why it worked um, and see how you got around with these problems. So I worked through a scrum with that and people learned a lot and other teams were watching what was happening and listening to what was happening. So it was another learning experience. Uh, the next one was the scrum of scrums. One thing that I got back from everybody is we don't know what the other teams are doing. And I said, but you're having a project meeting uh, with businesses, all different businesses, once a week. And they said, yes, and it goes for about an hour and a half to two hours. Uh, and everybody gets up and tells them all the different stories and bugs they're working on and, and uh, all those sort of things. And there's, there's questions going backwards and forwards and it just takes a little time and nobody understands it uh, that isn't in that team themselves. The person who isn't, nobody who's not talking understands what, this, what is being discussed. And it was a difficult time and there was, nobody wanted to be there. So I took over as the scrum of, I facilitated that meeting, uh, facilitated, facilitate, facilitated that meeting. And uh, they were keen for me to do so because they weren't getting anywhere either. And they thought, okay, well maybe you can do something with it. So I did. And for the week before, I sent out this thing to everybody. This is how you do a stand-up. Uh, something that I've already been through in training, but I told them how to do it. And I said, this meeting will take 10 minutes, and then it's finished. I said, you can stay there. I've made it for a half an hour because there might be some discussions afterwards or where two people want to talk. So they, we keep the room for a half an hour. And because it was uh, multi-city, we had to have it in a room so that we could see other people on the, uh, on the screen. So I put in some rules about it. I said, the first thing is it's not like a team stand-up. 
So we're only talking about goals. We don't want to hear a thing like a particular story or a uh, JIRA story number or a uh, task that you're doing or a particular bug. We just want to know what goals you have for this sprint. How are you tracking against those goals? Do you need any assistance from any technical person who might be on another team? Or are you going to meet them? Why not? Um, are you going to meet your goals and why not? And that, uh, that was an interesting thing. I put in two other things. I said, there are no discussions in a stand-up. Absolutely none. No discussion whatsoever. Uh, even if you have questions, you, you can't ask them. It's not the time for that. You talk to them afterwards. Uh, the only team members, only the team members, in this case only the DevOps managers, get to speak and stand up. Everybody else is totally welcome to come. Anybody and everybody can come along and listen in on what's happening, and that was there. And lo and behold, the first scrum of scrums that we held finished in 10 minutes. And I had everybody afterwards saying to me, wow, for the first time ever, I know what all the other teams are doing, and there was nothing technical discussed in there. It was fantastic. I now fully understand that. What we went into is now about 10 minutes, uh, 20 minutes long, because what we do is the scrum of scrums is 10 minutes. And then at the end of 10 minutes, we can say, right, the scrum of scrums is finished, uh, those that need to go can go, but otherwise we'll be here for another 10 minutes. Anybody got any further questions? Anybody want to discuss anything? And there's other discussions that happen afterwards in a very relaxed atmosphere, uh, which is very good. So 20 minutes on total. Marvellous. That's still going. It's fabulous. Uh, the third thing, uh, number six I had to learn was shut up and smile. Yes, it was all your idea. The thing I've been trying to tell you to do for the past 12 to 18 months, you've just come up with this wonderful idea. Uh, I am able to say, what a fabulous idea. Put that in and go for it. This might be one of the um, senior developers might come up and suggest, why don't we do this? I say, fabulous. Go and have a talk to your DevOps manager and see if they want to do that. I think that's a great idea. I'll support it, and away you go. And if, you know, it, 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 it kind of worked. I had to shut up because it's exactly what I've been trying to tell them to do. So number seven, how do you change a culture? Constantly. Uh, it's the only way. I strongly feel that. Uh, constantly is the way you change that in that uh, we had... Uh, I was always talking about different things. Um, my day consists of walking around teams and talking to them all the time. I'm always there. Uh, we had an online discussion board and I'm always putting little new things up and something that I might have read last night or something from the training sessions. Uh, or something that I'd seen or experienced in some other team in, in another location somewhere. And the other thing that I tried to, to lean heavily was the psychological safety uh, in that people can bring up things. I made a mistake and I wanted people to celebrate that. Hey, you made a mistake. The importance of failure. You've all heard of the statement I hope, of fail fast, learn fast. Uh, when the people hear that, first of all, they think, but we can't fail. Yes, you can. It's not about failing, it's about learning. It's the wrong, t the wrong focus to put about is the failings that we have, it's the importance of the learning you do. And why fail fast, I'm often asked. Well, there's an old saying that goes, if you find yourself in a hole, the first thing you should do is stop digging. And it relates to that as well. If you find that you're doing something wrong and it's going to fail, stop, stand back and say, what are we learning out of this? This isn't going to work. Do we need something to change? And, um, and before we carry on? Or uh, do we need to abandon this altogether and do something else? So that was quite um, constant going on the way, all the way through. Now, ownership number eight, the last one here, is something I couldn't get across. 
It's always somebody else's problem. I couldn't change that. Teams felt that they passed this on to the DevOps manager, therefore it was no longer their problem. It's wrong. I relate this to, let's say, for example, a team all had broken chairs. So it was very difficult. They couldn't sit on them for more than an hour before getting sore backs or whatever. Now, quite rightly, they might bring it up on the next stand-up meeting and ask the Scrum Master or the DevOps Manager to please solve the problem of the broken chairs. Now, what the team does at that point, uh, which they shouldn't do, and what these teams did was they felt that they'd passed the problem on now, is now up to DevOps Manager to fix. The DevOps Manager doesn't have any budget, so they go to their, uh, their manager and they say, hello, manager, I, our teams have got broken chairs. They need new chairs. The manager takes a look and says, there's nothing in my budget for furniture. I tell you what, I'll organise that for next year. In the next year's budget, there'll be new furniture ability. Well, and they, when it gets back to the team, it's always, oh, management doesn't understand. Management's terrible and everything else. Well, it's not the management's problem. Management probably got good chairs. Your scrum master probably has great chair. Uh, it's the team's problem. Only the team have broken chairs, so it's the team's problem. But they couldn't learn that it, they own that problem all the way until it's resolved or in some way or another. Um, they feel that they've got to, they passed on to somebody, therefore it's their, their problem now. It's not their problem. Uh, so what four things made the biggest difference? Out of all of them, training was the first one that really made a huge difference. Uh, and I'd highly recommend that as step one. Get everybody onto the same page. Um, but nothing in isolation. If I'd stopped at that, they would have been back at what they were doing very quickly. Uh, and the second one was teams no longer belong to the project. They're now able to operate several projects that don't belong to a particular business area. So uh, we discussed that. The teams control what they can control and ongoing permanent culture. We've got a, uh, a little saying uh, with agile coaches in New Zealand and that even the All Blacks need a coach. Now the All Blacks are a rugby team that, that almost never lose. They've won so many World Cups, and it's just, it's just, it's not whether they'll win or lose, it's how much they'll win by. Uh, it's that type of team, but they still have a coach. Even the All Blacks have a coach. So where I left them in the end, at the end of last year, uh, later past la part of last year, I my business was taking off. I needed to get out and, and operate my business full time, which I'm doing now, and uh, it was also time for a change. The teams would probably need somebody new now to come in with different ideas and different ways of helping. Uh, so I left them at that point. Now, where did I let them? I felt that they're not as advanced as other teams that I've had. They're not as, um, as far along as what I've seen other teams. But on the other hand, they've come a long, long, bulb, bumpy road. They've probably come from further back. The journey will never end, that's true of all teams and all agile transformations. And But I met a lot of friends along the way, friends that I know that I will treasure and meet again. So this, it was very difficult as a coach, very difficult at times, especially as a coach who doesn't need to be listened to. It's just a very difficult, it's, it was a learning experience for me. And I had this Gartner's Hype Cycle that I related this to. And the Gartner's Hype, Gartner's Hype Cycle relates to uh, IT um, hardware mainly, but new things that come in. There's the, the uh, technology trigger, and you've got this peak of inflated expectations. And I related this to the way we're putting an Agile there was this trigger, we're now doing Agile, here's this new Agile coach, where you go. There's this peak of inflated expectations, and it which drops immediately to the trough of disillusionment. It doesn't do what we immediately expected. Now, I was at the trough of disillusionment on, by midday the first day. Uh, <laughs> 
the slope of enlightenment happens over time. Now that will depend on what you're doing and that will depend on the team and the culture. Uh, within Stats New Zealand, that took a long time. The slope was very slow and very uh, took a while, but it worked. But it was a good slope. It, it was consistent. Uh, the slope I had with Stats LLC, with the private sector teams, was very steep. And then you get to a plateau of productivity. Notice the plateau of productivity isn't up that peak of inflated expectations. It's somewhere in between. So. That's what I had to think of all the way through with what we were doing. The other one is somebody from four, about three and a half to 4,000 years ago wrote this quote specifically for me, obviously, when uh, they knew what I was going to go through. So it's one that I actually added to my email signature. When it is obvious that the goals cannot be reached, don't adjust the goals adjust the action steps. So Confucius was right about that, and I had to keep that to my heart, and I had to read it all the time. So that's it for me. Thank you very much. I'm sorry I'm not there to answer your questions, but please join me on LinkedIn. Uh, send me an email at steve at dragonsarm.com. I'd love to hear from you uh, and your experiences and your questions. I'm always open. Okay, I guess we should have a huge round of applause for Steve. He could not be here, but he still put in all the efforts to record the video.